think it's good practice to kind of let things be temporary and understand that things are temporary. I look at it as giving the building vision for some of its last standing days and allowing it to be an observer uh, in relation to other buildings. Uh, so it's humans observing a building, observing buildings. My name is Joel Nicholas Peterson and I'm living in Vancouver, BC. Like the process is really important to me. It's like it is the work. Just kind of being being in that work. Like no matter how detailed or intricate, uh, just having that kind of focus and drive, and just kind of getting lost in the process. So this old warehouse downtown's getting demolished, and I want to turn it into a giant disposable camera. I think I'm gonna build four of them, like north, south, east, and west. And I plan on using this ancient technique called the camera obscura. I don't know if you've heard of it. But this massive camera needs massive film. So I got a couple of these big, heavy, 100-foot rolls of lithographic film. And I'm just gonna expose all of it. And then use all the negatives to make giant contact prints. Uh, using the cyanotype process, which is like also the original blueprint. I mean, this city is growing rapidly around this area, and um, you know, things are changing quite quickly. So, this is a documentation of a very specific moment in time and very specific location. Uh, from what I heard from Vince, my boss, um, when I first started here, this, uh, this building either used to be the, uh, the VPD horse stables way back in the day, or it was the VPD parking garage when they first started getting uh, police cars. This building's been around for over 100 years. It's seen two of the three Granville Bridge rebuilds. Uh, it's had automotive companies, all sorts of you know, storage spaces for uh, garages and ice cream companies even. I even heard once it was a horse stable for the Vancouver police. I don't know if that's true, but I mean, that's hearsay. City Council has approved a building project that will change the look of the city's skyline. A 52-story high-rise at the north end of the Granville Street Bridge was unanimously approved, giving the green light for a twisting tower designed by Danish architect BRK Ingels to be erected. The $400 million development will include a mix of residential suites and retail and office space. It's not just one building, it's a complex of four buildings, I think, kind of like intermingled into the, the on-ramps and off-ramps of the bridge and um, even underneath the bridge they're kind of doing a continuation of Granville Island on the Yale Town side here. Uh, I'm not a Yale Town resident. I used to live two blocks from here though. This neighborhood's, uh, I don't even know what, it, what it's called exactly. Uh, it's beside Yale Town, beside, um, under the Granville Street Bridge is where I often tell people I work. Um, in between Yale Town and the West End, in some purgatory kind of junky area in between the two bridges. <laughs> but uh, the, this new development will actually improve the area quite a bit. I mean, it'll be cool to see what comes up. And it is definitely sad to see the building go, but I don't know if it's been the best maintained over the years. I mean, like the roof leaks and, and stuff. And it'll be sad to no longer work here, but it will be cool and to have been a part of the end part of this building's history will be something. It's really
really just underdeveloped and um, you know waiting to become kind of a part of Yale Town here surrounded by Yale Town. At the beginning of the summer I got a call from uh, my contact at West Bank and uh, basically said if you're going to do this project now's the time. This is a pinhole camera made from things like poster board and hockey tape. Basically, we're building giant pinhole cameras. To do so, we're knocking out some floors and some walls, turning multiple units into larger rooms. This is that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Voila. Then we gotta black it out. So we're using some of the building materials from the demolition as well as drywall, drywall mud, caulking, uh, coroplast, and lots of gaffer tape, which is the new duct tape. And basically just creating a, an ideal pitch black environment. Darkness is only the absence of light. So light will make its way into anywhere if it isn't stopped. Camera Obscura is basically the foundation of all photography. It consists of just a dark chamber or dark room with one opening allowing light into the room. Uh, the opening is called an aperture as far as photography is concerned. Obviously the best wall to put a hole through is the one facing outside because that has the best view. In one case it only consisted of knocking out a pane of glass, um, blacking it out and adding an aperture. But in most cases, it was getting through eight inch reinforced concrete, um, which took a little more tenacity. So we rented this concrete chainsaw to cut through the walls and uh, create the first hole for the next obscura. It's water cooled and a lady from the showroom downstairs came and told us that we created a leak in the showroom. Uh, so that's not a good scene. Too bad. Gassed out the whole third floor too. So the chainsaw didn't work. That was a bad idea. Didn't make any friends on that one and ended up having to make a new hole for it anyways. Um, so from there we just went back to the caveman days with a pickaxe and chisels and, well, I guess hammer drill, a little more advanced. But uh, basically in the end we got through the walls with the hammer drill and a pickaxe and chisels. This camera has no lens or flash to amplify light. I just drilled an eighth inch hole in a recycled can, and that's really all it is. So basically, I'm just going to tape around this aperture piece here. And I'll line it up right in the center to make sure the image is what I want, and just tape it right in place. And from that little hole there, we get a very large image. It can be confusing at first, but because it always moves in a straight line, light from the very top of an image ends up at the bottom after passing through an aperture, creating an upside down and reversed version of itself. So that's the same way your eye works and your brain actually makes sense of it all and flips it right side up. This dates back to the very uh, fundamental like physics of photography. Even uh, documented by Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, um, observing it through a wicker basket allowing light into the into the dark basket through one of the cracks. Sitting in one of these cameras waiting um, waiting for your eyes to adjust before you set the film up for like an exposure is a trip. It is complete darkness. Um, you can't even see an inch in front of you. Your pupils and eyes try to adjust um, to see any any source of light for minutes and you're still not able to see any light. It's a lot like sensory deprivation. Amazing. You don't see stuff like that on your day to day.
Uh, it starts off really dark. Uh, the naked eye can't really see what's going on too much, but over time, uh, the light just seeps in and it just kind of just puts this image like just blasting right through to the wall. Alright, Rosen, do you just want to help me pin this and then I can be spraying you guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my job is just to make sure that everything is basically up, set it properly so that no, you know, damage can be done to the film during the process, like it falling off or breaking. Okay. The images I'm taking are still frames, but when you're inside a camera obscure experiencing this, it's completely, um, yeah, it's live action. It's movement and all. It's real life in a different light. Uh, right now we're inside Camera North, facing downtown Vancouver and the mountains. Uh, the image behind me is blurry because the aperture right now is quite large. But typically there's a much smaller aperture and the image is a lot sharper and more focused. Uh, however, even with the special camera we're using for this interview, it wouldn't be able to collect enough light uh, for us actually to, to make it worthwhile interviewing in here. So these won't be like quick snapshots or anything because the room's really dark and the film is pretty slow. Um, we had to build kind of like levels and stairs and stuff like that to get up there so that we could actually reach 14 feet to pin it up. Mm -hmm. um, shutter is just going to be a piece of tape so as soon as the time's right, just remove the tape and start the clock and just go for it. So the exposure time is going to be at least 26 minutes for the dark areas. Maybe less if it's really bright outside, but about six minutes for the light areas, 26 for dark areas. So we're shooting for sunny days or partly cloudy days just to catch those those moments or those you know glimpses of. Uh, time when the when the light is right or we have nice skies or something interesting happening You know you're sitting there watching the light expose this film and you know what's happening you you're paying attention to the reactions and You're paying attention to the time and you know you're you have to be on point too because you don't want to ruin this huge piece of film you have to kind of time out and gauge the lights even outside because the exposure times vary just depending on the day and the weather even. So sometimes you'll add a few minutes to the exposure time and then you'll dodge the, dodge the horizon down. So it varies quite a bit and we have to implement uh, some traditional darkroom techniques. Anyone who's taken a photography class in high school or university uh, knows dodging and burning. So we're we're doing some large-scale dodging and burning on these on these four by seven foot negatives, four by ten foot negatives. Well, the pressure is on. They've demolished all the surrounding buildings. Uh, hazmat people are coming soon. Our cameras are going to be obstructed and we'll be asked to leave the building soon enough. So we just gotta put a hustle on finishing all these exposures and, uh, and develop all of the film. And then we gotta get out of there. Um, so the chemicals I'm using for the lithographic film are identical to your typical darkroom chemicals. You have your developer, your stop bath, your fixer, and your washing bath, if you'd like. Uh, so you run through those stages, uh, rinsing off the film after the stop and after your fixer, and doing a final wash with water, um, you know, a few times over. And so it's basically the same process, um, just, you know, a bit of a new twist because developing a 4 by 8 foot piece of film can't easily be done in trays. Definitely not efficiently or effectively. So the method I came up with is using uh, manually pumped chemical sprayers that you buy in the paint store. And this was after a lot of trial and error, kind of experimenting with how to possibly develop these mega format negatives. So I found the sprayers to work the best for this and using a drainage system kind of
collect the chemicals and reuse the chemicals as much as possible. Lonely Alta Roy speaking. Hey there. Um, I was looking to talk to somebody about recycling some uh, photographic chemicals. Oh, okay. Yeah, we could take it. There'll be a price involved. Yeah. Uh, film photography definitely, definitely isn't the greenest uh, compared to digital. It's, digital's way more green, way more efficient. But, you know, film, you have uh, a raw, pure reaction of sunlight and silver happening. Uh, so a pure physical reaction. Which uh, you know holds us holds a kind of energy or essence to it. Whether artists have a role in documenting history or not is always going to be subjective, but I feel like artists always document history, whether they're trying to or not. Uh, they'll either reflect the era they live in through fashion, design, architecture. Um, there's always going to be historical documentation in art as it's a reflection of the time that the artist is living in or speaking about. I mean, the building itself has a history. It's over a hundred years old, it's been around for a bunch of developments in the area, like tons of developments. It has it's had a lot of businesses run through it, had a lot of owners, and it's seen a lot of things. It's seen the city change like immensely around it. Um, and now I guess it's going to be part of that change as it comes down and gets rebuilt. The idea of the project is to have both the negatives and the positives together as a diptych or as a pair uh, because both are so important to the final, the final outcome and the idea of the project itself. I chose the cyanotype process because it's extremely efficient for this job. It's only a two-part process. You mix the chemicals together, paint them on, let it dry and expose it with UV light uh, with a contact print uh, using your negative. Ideally, we wanted to use the sunlight because, you know, all you need is UV light to expose cyanotypes. So that would be ideal. Use the sunlight to make the prints and, you know, even use the rain to develop them. Uh, being Vancouver and being like winter now, we don't get a lot of sunlight, let alone it would just be so variable, the, the intensity of the light and you know, the exposure times required, it'd be pretty hard to calculate and get consistency. So I'm going to build an exposure unit uh, that just basically burns these prints with UV and then just process them with water. You just like building stuff? I just love building stuff. Getting into this project, I was well aware that the building was coming down, and in fact, that's the only reason I was able to do this project. So I'm 100% at peace with all of this work and all these cameras kind of crumbling into rubble with this building. You know, they stood with the building and they'll fall with the building. Just inside what's left of the old dark room here, um, we've got what's left of the development table. I'm not sure how they're going to demolish it. It doesn't look like they're going to implode it, so maybe just knock it over with some excavators or a wrecking ball or something. Old wrecking ball style. 
There's zero power in the building right now. We're using battery powered everything and cell phone LEDs. But it's kind of an interesting feeling in here right now, just everything is being torn apart and separated and deconstructed. Oh, I liked the idea of using the blueprint for these building scapes because all of these buildings had blueprints and you can just reproduce it. So probably one of the most archival photographic uh, processes. Oh yeah, oh, I plan to use this exposure unit for many different, many different projects afterwards. Like just the fact that it's UV allows you to burn silk screens and stuff like that. So I can make massive silk screens now. So this is a seven foot by four foot, uh, just the left panel of the east camera. And it's all green and yellow because uh, we haven't washed it yet. And when it gets washed, it's gonna just turn blue and white. And then when it dries, it's gonna be a really rich, like archival dark blue cyanotype. it for a minute and just give it a second wash. I don't know if it speaks to any social issues or anything like that directly, but uh, it's definitely capturing this time in Vancouver where things are just getting torn down and put back up uh, bigger and taller and, you know, new materials. And it's just expanding rapidly. Um, you know, houses, you can see a perfectly fine house, but you know that house isn't going to be standing for another three years, you know? And that's like. That's a truth everywhere in this city. So like, I was doing research just to kind of try to, you know, get some ideas of how to go about developing these things and whatnot and see what's been done before. Just kind of realized like it has been done in many different forms, but not quite like this form, not like a film transparency. Um, so I sent in an application months ago just for fun and they got back to me like a month ago or something. Uh, like application accepted, <laughs> like send us your evidence basically. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Criderman with Underhill and Underhill Land Surveyors. I'm a British Columbia Land Surveyor, Canada Land Surveyor and a professional engineer. This is Jonathan Dyke uh, of the same company and we are here measuring what could be one of the largest photographic negatives ever. 
3.941 Yeah, I bear witness. <laughs> that is a lot of serendipity. Uh, looking to exhibit the show, I just stumbled upon a space that happened to be owned by West Bank also. <laughs> They're very interested in having it shown in, in one of their very public spaces, which happens to be the most ideal space that I could ever hope to exhibit this work, initially at least for the opening. about it uh, today <laughs> and my friend just sent me a link uh, from Van City Bus yeah. and we saw it and the pictures looked really cool online so we had to see it in person. I felt like the way that Joel decided to preserve the memory of this building was very intentional in the sense of an old building that held a lot of memories and held a lot of, uh, well, a lot of use for the city. Oh, and the way that he decided to preserve that building's memory is almost like that building spoke in those same old terms as Camera Obscura and Blueprint um, because of how old it was. I think it's, it's great and the results are uh, brilliant and uh, the whole concept this is interesting. hope they take home some sort of inspiration or insight, or I just hope they've created their own personal dialogue. It's kind of a reminder that things constantly change, and as things develop and change, that everyone kind of has their own responsibility to kind of direct that change or make it something positive. <laughs> 